Strangely enough, I was shot down by the Swedes. As a pilot of a four-engine Lancaster bomber, on takeoff we were given a 30-minute window, and if for any reason you couldn't get off, you were scrubbed. Well, this particular night, the target was Essen in the Ruhr Valley. Happy Valley, we called it. <laughs> a hot target, we used to say. My inner starboard engine refused to turn over. He sent the flare up, and the mechanics truck came out and put a ladder up against the cowling. We sat there alone as the rest of the squadron took off, and then suddenly it was all silence as the rest of the squadron had come airborne, but not us. He replaced the coil. That's what was wrong with the engine. The 29 and a half minute mark, we were told to go. Hello, I'm Michael Veach. Over the course of three years and two books, uh, these books, I fulfilled a lifelong ambition of seeking out and recording some of the untold stories from the men who flew in the air forces of the Second World War. The navigators, the bomb aimers, the flight engineers, and of course the pilots, Australian, British, Canadian, South African, even a couple of Germans, who flew over the cities, the jungles, the deserts and the oceans of a world at war. I found that without exception, every one of these remarkable men had at least one extraordinary story to tell. And now, on stage with you, I'd like to share some of those stories. My navigator uh, altered the course to uh, make up the time. He did a dog leg. Then it brought us out over the Kattegat, over, uh, over Sweden and Denmark. You see, Sweden was a neutral country. Uh, illuminated. We'd spent three years flying over blacked out cities in wartime Europe. We'd never seen anything like it. All the lights, the car lights. <laughs> At 16,000 feet, we, 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 we crowded up against the windows. We could see all these lights. We said, Come have a look at this, Stan. Anyway, the Swedes, although neutral, they defended their neutrality quite strongly at times. Four of those lights we were looking at started to move like an incandescent bunch of grapes moving slowly towards us. I, I knew what they were. They were shells. We were being fired at. Over Helsingborg, I think it was. I, I felt the impact under the aircraft... The controls went limp. Now, now, my flight engineer was just behind me to my right. Now, he didn't have his parachute harness on. I unbuckled, <coughs> ordered jump, jump, jump into the intercom. I helped him with his harness. It's a big clip, and I clipped it on from behind. And then nothing. Just white. It's quite peaceful. It's a bright light. Well, my first thought was, uh, well, I'm dead. Mum's going to be terribly upset. And then a funny thing started to happen. Uh, I saw something in my, in my vision or my mind's eye or, or, or something. It was, it was something turning, a piece of, well, metal. It occurred to me, oh, this is part of the aircraft's cowling. What's that doing there? It's how you're funny how your mind works. And then I, I thought, well, if, if this, is the, this is the cowling in front of me, it's probably falling, and I'm falling with it. So now might be a good time to open my parachute, which I did. I came down in a newly turned field of turnips or something like that, pitch black. I watched the rest of the aircraft crashed to the ground a couple of miles away. It took out a substation of the local town we were in. So it was all black. I could just make out a building or a structure. I walked up to the door and knocked. And very slowly, a door opened and a startled family cowering inside the door was looking at me. I said, um, Australia. A little patch on the shoulder, you see, it says Australia. A pilot, 
Oh, they'd heard what had happened overhead. It turns out that uh, one of the shells hit the cookie, the big 4,000 pounder in the bomb bay, and the aircraft had exploded. And for some reason, uh, I was simply expelled from it, like a pip being squeezed from an orange. It was completely unharmed. The rest of my crew were killed. You see, the Royal Air Force was a marvellous organisation before the war, absolutely marvellous. You see, so many people think it was the exclusive domain of the Oxford and Cambridge types. That's not true at all. Yeah, we had chaps from all over the empire, Australians, uh, South Africans, New Zealanders. There was, however, Lord Dudley. Now, Lord Dudley achieved some notoriety for being the first person to be court-martialed for taking a dog on an aeroplane. But he managed to beat the rap by convincing the board it wasn't a dog at all, but a hound. I was at a 19th Squadron, Duxford, the first squadron to be equipped with the Spitfire. I remember the day they arrived. We were told of being re-equipped with the new aircraft. At 11am we had to wait on the uh, tarmac. And there it came over the horizon, this tiny aircraft. Beautiful. Exquisite sound from the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. We stood there, jaws agape, never seen anything like it. It was a beautiful bank and a roll right over our heads. I was shot down on the 31st of July, 1940, the second week of the Battle of Britain. A beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky over South England. We'd been uh, scrambled of uh, Angels 1-8, 18,000 feet, to meet a formation of uh, Dorniers coming over from South End. I was a wingman to the squadron leader, uh, Pace his name was. We called him Ace, Ace Pace, I don't know why. <laughs> we formed line astern, Behind the German aircraft, I could still see this big Dorney in front of me with this green splinter pattern. Now, at, at that stage, we were with the Spitfire 1A, the first type to be equipped with a 20 millimeter cannon on the wings. Later, the cannons became very effective, but these were the early days. And so I lined up behind this German aircraft. I could still see the gunner looking at me as I looked at him. I pressed the firing button, nothing. Click, and then nothing. The guns are jammed. And then three things happened almost simultaneously. I felt a knock just below my left knee, like a hammer. No pain, but a knock. Like a cricket ball or something like that. The controls went limp, and the aircraft went into a shallow dive. I looked down and saw my bare foot, loose, hanging by a thread of tendon just below the knee. A bullet from the uh, gunner of the Dornier had pierced my radiator, snapped the control cables, and gone through my shin bone. I stood up in the seat of the aircraft with my good leg. I released the hood, but the aircraft you see is a 45 degree dive from 30,000 feet. The air pressure sucked me back onto the rear of the cockpit wall. I couldn't get out of the aircraft, you see. I was being soaked with petrol because the bullet had also pierced the front fuel tank, just in front of the dashboard. For some reason it didn't explode. I was very lucky. I managed to get free of the aircraft eventually, and then the silence of this beautiful day as I came down on the parachute. I looked down, I could see cows and villages and the farmyards of Kent. I noticed though that my leg it still wasn't painful. It was hanging on by a thread, and great globules of blood were spurting out. I knew that wasn't good. I still had my uh, uh, radio telephone attached to my leather harness, so I wound it around my leg and floated down. I came down in a stubble field. A farm boy came up to me, nearly ran me through with a pitchfork. I said, go and get a bloody ambulance. He thought I was a German, you see. That was my very short battle of Britain. Yes, hello, my dear. What can I tell you? Uh, 
I'm a Berlin boy, born on the banks of the Spree. I was just 10 years old when Hitler came to power. Ever since I was a small child, I wanted to fly. I, I met him, you know. Then I, then I have the uh, Esther Cross, Esther Cla uh, Iron Cross, First Class, the Ritter Cross, Knight's Cross. I stood as far away from him as you are now. We take the train to Berchtesgaden. The SS cars meet us at the station and take us up to the Berghof. And there he was, Hitler. I was not impressed. I thought he was a little man, a small man, not impressive. But Ava Brown was lovely. I flew all types in the Luftwaffe. Mr. Schmidt 110, Heinkel 111, Donia 217. My favorite aircraft, though, was the Junkers 52, transport, tri-motor. I remember they have our orders to fly into the castle. The, uh, that's the vice of the kettle. Stalingrad. Winter 1943-44. The remains of the 6th Army surrounded by the Russians. We fly in to pick up the wounded. Thousands and thousands of our soldiers surrounded by the Russians. Not seven, eight hundred meters away only. Twenty-three degrees below zero centigrade. Uh, we land on the ice to uh, pick up some of the wounded on stretches. These men. I've seen many terrible things in the war, but nothing like this. These men were skeletons. Had beards. Sores. No ammunition. Freezing, no food, no hope. We could not turn the engines off, it was too cold. We would not get them started again. We lower on the wounded, and the men rush the aircraft, desperate to get out. Our own military polizei, the military police, shoot them. Our own men, it happened in front of my eyes. I sit in the cockpit, I see these men being shot. I can still see their blood on the ice. We take off under fire. We fly over the Russians, they fire up at us. We fly back to Poland. On the outside of the aircraft, I see on the fuselage and the wings the skin of the men who touched the frozen metal of the aircraft, like gloves, frozen. I cannot forget this, never.